welcome and ting and ting and ting back with another video for you all and uh, someone suggested uh, this video to me here now i've heard about this before but uh, i don't know the true actual historical story of it so you know i'm intrigued to see what this is our uh, world war one christmas truce silent night and this is an extra history vibe right here, you know. So let's go ahead and YouTube and Sim Simmer. And this is part one. So there's quite possibly a part two that I'm going to be watching. <laughs> let's YouTube and Sim Simmer and see what this is about. Supposed to be over by now. This little holiday special is brought to you by World of Tanks. Use the invite code Armistice if you're a new player who wants to check out the game. The Christmas Truce is one of the most poignant events of the First World War, a time when men rose up above the madness of the conflict and, for just a moment, saw each other as fellow humans. This is an event that definitely did happen. Thousands of men laid down arms in the truce, but a century of retellings has also kind of sanded down its rough edges and oversimplified its messy reality. Indeed, this event wasn't just the result of pure human spirit and holiday cheer. It was a host of unique factors that drove these okay. enemies to spontaneously declare peace in no man's land. And really, it may not have been all that spontaneous. Small armistices were happening every day. As frontline troops became accustomed to the rhythms of trench warfare, they learned that looking the other way now and then could bring a shred of safety and calm to their lives. The armies ate meals at the same time, which became a daily ceasefire. Patrols frequently ignored each other, adopting a live-and-let-live live attitude. Troops often shouted to each other across the lines. After all, the autumn battles had passed, and both sides were waiting out the winter. In reality, the weather was the primary enemy for oh. both sides. The high water table at Flanders meant that the trenches were always filling with water, sometimes collapsing and burying men inside. Soldiers leaned against the walls to sleep, trying to keep themselves out of the wet. Food supplies had to be hung up on dugout ceilings. And that winter had been particularly miserable. Weeks of rain flooded the dugouts. The mud pulled men down like quicksand. Now, British Field Marshal Sir John French had noticed the hands-off attitude his men were developing towards the enemy, and so he ordered attacks in late December to boost morale. And this resulted in heavy British losses. Concerned about possible fraternization over the holiday, he issued orders that no unofficial armistice would be tolerated. Morale was much better over in the German trenches. After all, they were winning. But many men were also experiencing their first holiday away from home. Knowing that this would be difficult, commanders brought Christmas to the trenches, shipping thousands of presents to the field. Each man received a gift from the Kaiser, cigar boxes for NCOs, a pipe with the crown prince on it for the ranks. The British, for their part, received a brass box from Princess Mary filled with cigarettes, tobacco, a Christmas card, and sweets. And then there were personal packages. Enterprises sprang up on the home front, offering family members a chance to send gift boxes to the troops. British soldiers received plum puddings and thousand-count boxes of cigarettes. German and Austrian troops were bombarded with chocolate and salami and cognac. Wow. Both sides received winter clothing. In truth, though, the gifts were kind of a nuisance. I mean, there was nowhere to put it all. Soldiers didn't have a place to store a thousand extra cigarettes. But that Christmas Eve delivered a true gift. The rain stopped, and the trenches drained. Dry cold froze the mud into a hard surface, almost like a floor. Snow dusted the countryside. That afternoon, the gunfire dwindled, and in some sectors it stopped entirely. The weather just seemed too nice for it. The Germans, stuffed with Christmas chocolate and cheered by the weather, started that, putting lit Tannenbaum up on their trench parapet. Isn't that crazy? They were so fed up of fighting that they were having their own little truces within the battle. Do you know what that proves? We aren't meant to endure stuff like that we're not it's like i'm not going to shoot that guy today and i know during during the invasion back home guys were like uh in the lot of the fighting guys were like throwing marijuana okay you, you put the 
get a piece of paper or, or even a leaf or something and you put some marijuana in it and you put a stone in it and you throw it over to the other side you know and at night you could smell the other side uh, the marine smoking up a little doobie and thing you know what i mean so that happens in war more than you think and for just a speck of a moment humanity plays a part in the whole scheme of things in that situation people they they, they they become human for a second now it's part by the miserable conditions but the fact that we revert to that instead of uh going well let's just get up and just go kill them all right off the bat you know what i mean which at some points i guess that happens but you know what i'm saying you get so fed up of all the noise and the screaming and the death and the, and uh, you just want it to stop even if it's just for a second you just wanted to stop and that's what those dudes were those those, those soldiers were, were encountering they're living under those horrible conditions and you got leaders talking about fight, fight, fight. Well, mainly poor people are out there battling. And I'm not saying it wasn't a necessary war. And I'm not saying there's never a necessary war. Some people have to be tamed. Or they'll just destroy others. Still though, we weren't meant to do that. And these days where leaders aren't the ones in the thick of things. No, in most cases their kids aren't in the thick of things unless they really want to go there they don't know what it feels like it's kind of like rich people living higher on the hog and poor and they don't know how poor people live but they're the ones running the country how are they gonna know they're not gonna know how it is to be on the front lines in those muddy waters you know sinking in mud you know what i mean watching your friends die daily because they're chilling you know they out there screaming, oh, you know, these great men, blah, 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 you know. But it's cool to see that humanity take precedence. Now, coming out of that, I remember my mom used to say all the time, you know, the world should be like Christmas Day because of this. This is where I think she got that from. She knew the story of the twos during the First World War. So, you know. Christmas is supposed to bring peace on Earth. And then the German line started singing. Over on the British parapets, watchmen of the Scots Guard saw lines of lights along the enemy trench. At first they suspected an attack, but then they heard an ethereal sound drifting across no man's land. Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht, the original Austrian version of Silent Night. Sensing a challenge, Guards Officer Lieutenant Sir Edward Hulse decided that they should drown this out with their own carol. The sides went back and forth, but soon the competition merged into a harmony of Good King Wenceslas and Old Lang Syne. <laughs> the men began shouting Christmas greetings across the line, jokingly at first. A few even stepped out to talk. Hulse didn't know it, but the same thing was happening up and down the entire British line. Agreements formed. In some sectors, the officers met at the wire and shook hands, agreeing to cease hostilities the next day. Wow. In other areas, the ranks took the lead. Germans shouting across no man's land, English, tomorrow if you no shoot, we no shoot. At times, it was just one brave soul walking into no man's land waving a newspaper. These overtures were extremely dangerous. Though peace was breaking out in certain areas, it didn't happen everywhere. One British regiment responded to German caroling with a machine gun blast. Some unarmed soldiers were gunned down trying to broker this holiday armistice. But in most sectors, the ceasefire held. This truce mostly happened between German and British units. The French and the Belgians, whose countries were under German occupation, were less inclined. There were agreements to bury the dead and cease hostilities, but not as much fraternization. Yet, a Bavarian unit held fire during a French mass, and both sides halted fighting long enough for a guest, a soloist from the Paris Opera, to make a performance. Wow. British Indian troops, who were a bit unfamiliar with this whole Christmas deal, saw the lit German trees and thought of their own holiday of Diwali. They held fire, but also held position, until some Germans tempted them out of the trenches with cigars and cigarettes. Soon, the men were smoking together on the parapet. That Christmas night, the troops slept in sublime quiet. 
Christmas Day dawned bright and cold, the sky clear for the first time in weeks. To their shock, British troops looked across no man's land to see the Germans walking around on their parapets. Such a thing was suicidal in daylight, and that gesture of trust more than anything lured a few British out. Wow. It was heaven to at last stand up straight wow. and walk on solid earth. Some had ventured into no man's land on Christmas Eve, but in daylight it was impossible to ignore the bodies lying between the trenches. The two sides buried their dead in common graves, grieving side by side in joint services, listening to the faraway sounds of battle from other sectors. And that shared experience broke down the wall. Soldiers milled about together in no man's land, swapping over abundant gifts from home. British beef for uniform buttons, chocolate cake for barrels of beer. They exchanged hats. One German barber gave haircuts. The men chatted. After all, they shared so much in common. Yeah. They lived in the same fields under the same rain, and they were equally sick of war. Besides and the thing about it too, they, share, they probably talk about family and, and children and mothers and brothers and sisters and, and told stories about Christmas past and stories about playing soccer or football as we would know it. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Right in the middle of a war. Right in the... We see, most of the times, one group of soldiers don't really hate the other. They're just fighting for certain ideologies, religions, beliefs, or something like that. You know what I mean? And that's why I firmly believe if we actually get to know each other and know each other's stories, that we will be less inclined to, to react the way we do the things. Because most people in the world is just working and trying to survive and trying to enjoy life and enjoy their kids and, you know, live moment to moment and thing, you know what I mean? And then they just get thrust into the, a war situation. And usually the wars aren't about what, nowadays at least, it's not about what we have been told. It's just that some people manipulate and create wars because war is big profit anymore. You know what I'm saying and thing? Power and profit. It's a beautiful thing, you know what I mean? But you, it's to being told, but it's not being emphasized that this happened. You know what I'm saying? And even the Indians came out not even knowing what Christmas is. They missed the Diwali. And they, too, you know what I mean, have found a sense of peace a little bit in the vibe. That's just that's human spirit right there. Besides, they were curious. What was life like on the other side? Who were these enemies? One British officer was perplexed to learn that his new German friend believed the armies of the Kaiser fought for freedom. That was impossible, the officer responded. We're fighting for freedom. Amid this, Lieutenant Hulse found himself talking to Lieutenant Thomas of the 15th Westphalians, who had something to pass on, a Victoria Cross and a packet of letters. An English officer had died in the German trench during the last attack. Perhaps he could give these to the man's family? Touched, Hulse removed his own silk scarf, a gift from home, and presented it in thanks. Thomas, embarrassed that he had nothing to give in return, sent a soldier to fetch the fur gloves that his family had sent. Up and down the line, men started bringing out footballs. Kickabouts broke out, with men from both sides chasing the ball among shell holes and sliding on the frozen ground. In one sector, a group of Highlanders challenged a Saxon regiment, who burst out laughing whenever a kilt flew up during play. <laughs> but not all of this activity was goodwill. On both sides, a few used the gatherings to reconnoiter enemy trenches, and both sides used the time to repair dugouts. Of course, for some, this fraternization appeared false. One British soldier flashed his squad mate a hidden dagger, while another refused to smoke German cigarettes, fearing that they might be poisoned. When one squad of Bavarians discussed whether to meet the British, their corporal snapped at them. Such a thing should not happen in wartime. Have you no German sense of honor left at all? They weren't surprised. The night before, the same soldier had refused to join the unit's Christmas service. Corporal Hitler was odd like that. But his disapproval reflected the general's view. This was exactly the situation that Field Marshal French had feared. Commanders dispatched senior officers to threaten disciplinary action and insist that the men restart the war. 
In some sectors, the armistice came to an orderly close. Officers from both sides saluted and fired revolvers into the air, signaling that, all right, the war was back on. Let's In a few places, other. troops resisted until nearly to New Year's Eve, but the generals would not have it. German command dispatched snipers to break the ceasefire. French ordered an artillery barrage, letting the machinery of war roll over the human connections of the frontline troops. Nothing like this Christmas truce would happen again. The generals wouldn't allow it. On Christmas Eve 1915, British officers ordered a 24-hour artillery barrage. Men who tried to form a truce were court-martialed. Machine guns drowned out German carols. But the generals needn't have bothered. The spirit of that truce was unique to 1914, a symptom of a young war. By Christmas 1915, those troops had experienced chlorine gas and creeping bombardments. Zeppelins were bombing London. The Battle of Verdun would end just before the holiday, leaving 750,000 casualties. Indeed, many of the men who celebrated in no man's land that day would never see another Christmas. One of those unlucky ones was Lieutenant Sir Edward Hulse, who had sung carols and given a German officer his silk scarf. He died three months later while trying to save a wounded comrade. He was 25. And yet, Hulse is not remembered today for his military achievements, or even the book of letters that his friends published after his death. He and so many others are remembered for a victory entirely their own, when a group of brave men ventured into the line of fire, trusting their enemies not to shoot, and believing that humanity was better than the bonfire it had built for itself. Happy holidays, everybody. And it is better. It is better. It is better that... Uh that we know about each other and learn about each other and respect each other, respect our differences, celebrate the differences. Because if we all were the same thinking the same in this world, it would be a boring, boring, boring place. Somebody uh, had asked me in the comment section, what is, uh, why are you so uh, learning so much about Serbia? What is the connection? And I responded in a comment and I said, humanity, man, we are humans. Why wouldn't I want to know about you? Why would I say, oh, they're all the way over there. I don't want to know about them. And let other people besides them tell me how they are. And I judge them from what these people are telling me instead of trying to find out about them. See, the, the thing about it is if we find out about each other, then we're going to realize how, how similar we are. You know, nobody wants that, especially in these times where war means profit. A lot of people may have disagree with me like that, you know what I mean? Listen, I love my country as much as the next guy. But I would rather us get along and enjoy each other's country instead of fighting. Enjoy each other's culture, including the religion. We don't have to convert. We don't have to. It's just live in peace and a uh, yeah, perfect example of it here. I mean, we don't want that. And you, you see where one, one group says we're fighting for freedom and the other group says we're fighting for freedom. Then you have to ask whose freedom are we fighting for? And I'm not talking about this specific war in general. I'm just talking about overall. Whose freedom? Most soldiers come back from war here or wherever they are. They're just as poor before they leave. They're not as free as they were supposed to be to, 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 to enjoy life and do all of that. Go back to the same old, same old. We had two revolutions and a war back home. And as far as the standard of living and stuff, nothing changed. Nothing changed. It was still the same before. We went back to doing what we were doing. The invasions and the revolutions just interrupted it for a second. I'm gonna leave a link in the description to this video here so that you could check it out yourself and thing and, and, and really get the gist of the vibe. You understand what I'm gonna say? I'll also leave uh, links uh, for other videos that I've uh, re I reacted to in the cards here so you could check it out. Thank you all so much for all the comments and uh, thank you for watching this with me. Thank you for all the information that you all bestow onto me. Whether you be a uh, Serb, uh, an Irish person, a Romanian person, I have Slovenians on there. The other day there was a French person on there speaking. 
I'm getting it from the horse's mouth. I'm not listening to all that news and stuff like that. You guys teach me and I could go tell people and educate people about how it is from your perspective. Because we got to get both sides. You understand what I'm saying? Y'all take care of each other, all right? Cool credits.